questions. I'm Delisa Randall Griffiths. I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of the committee and tonight is really exciting for us. This is the fifth out of seven events that we have done from November through, we'll end up in May. And um, I was thinking about tonight, this is very different than anything else we've done. On the other hand, it almost feels like this is as close to what we normally do at at the band show in the summer uh, as anything in the season. So hopefully you all had a chance to watch the beautiful performance that John and Karen put together called A Cultivated Friendship. And hopefully you brought lots of questions. I'm already seeing some questions in the uh, chat. A few people sent questions ahead. So we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. But I do want to start by saying tonight is beyond our wildest dream, because when we envisioned creating this virtual programming, we had no idea how it would bloom. And in bloom, indeed, it did. And so much so that tonight, not only do we have John and Karen here to answer your questions, but we're very, very fortunate to have Daniel Bratton with us. And Daniel is coming all the way, uh, zooming in all the way from Canada, um, but he teaches at the University of Waterloo, but he's a, he was a local originally, and he was the one that edited the book of letters between Brumfield and Wharton in a lovely book called, I wanna get it right, Yours Ever Affectionately. And so you will definitely wanna check that book out after tonight. So I'm gonna let us get started by letting Daniel explain um, his connection to Ohio and his connection to these letters and how it all got started. Thank you, can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, well, I grew up in Brecksville, Ohio, which is now a suburb of Cleveland. But uh, my family had been there since the early 1840s. And so when my father was born in Brexville, it was just a, a, a village, really. I think there were fewer than 500 people there. And so, you know, my family were farmers. Uh, my father was the, the first generation not to earn a living from farming. And uh, so, you know, when you grow up in Northeastern Ohio and you have a family involved in farming, you hear about Louis Brownfield when you're growing up. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's part of Northeastern Ohio lore. And I thought it was really interesting. I've been reading Stephen Heyman's book, his biography, which I think is quite wonderful. And he, he pointed out, and uh, I think uh, you pointed out this as well, Delisa, that if, if you don't grow up in Northeastern Ohio, you, you don't grow up with the name Brownfield. You know, it, it, everybody knows about Brownfield in, that part of Ohio, but uh, I soon discovered that, uh, you know, uh, I did my work on Edith Wharton, my PhD is on Edith Wharton, and when I proposed uh, editing the letters of Wharton and Brownfield, uh, I, I met nothing but negative responses because uh, nobody in the Edith Wharton Society, uh, first of all, very few had heard of Brownfield, and those who had heard of Brownfield thought it wasn't worth putting out the letters. Uh, in fact, I even had a former president of the Edith Wharton Society remark, if it were Gertrude Stein rather than Brownfield, it might be worth doing. <laughs> uh, so what happened was I finished my dissertation in 83. I'd been living in Canada since 1969. Uh, and then I went off for um, 17 years to the Far East in the midst of all this, but I was home visiting my mother after I published my dissertation and she said, let's go down to Malabar Farm. And at that point, I knew, I know there's a question about artifacts coming up. <laughs> I wanted to look for a book, uh, it's, it's uh, The Farm, that uh, I believe to be in Bromfield's library. And I found it and it was inscribed to a Jeffersonian Democrat from a Victorian. That's how Wharton identified. So I started doing, that's when I got into Brownfield, even though I'd grown up with Brownfield. I'd been to Malabar Farm as a boy. I was trying to think back, I must have been six or seven. So it would have been just after Brownfield's death that I first went to Malabar Farm. And it must have been run by the Friends of the Land at that time. Uh, and then I returned there with my parents several times. Uh, 
very quickly, my mother had, had actually gone to Malabar Farm in 1945 with her garden club, the Brexville Garden Club, uh, that were affiliated with the Western Reserve chapter, Friends of the Land, and Bromfield showed them all around Malabar Farm. So I, I actually have in front of me right now a letter that Bromfield wrote to the garden club thanking them for their visit. So, you know, we did return to Malabar over the years, and I remember my mother commenting that the house was looking kind of shabby at one point when, when we toured the inside. Uh, so I, I, I was away when the, I think uh, people probably from the area will know this better than I. I. I'm not quite sure when the state of Ohio took over Malabar Farm, but I've been back since then. Um, and uh, I remember hearing the barn had burned at one point. And uh, I haven't been back for a number of years, uh, but I've always had a place in my heart for Bromfield. And uh, one final interesting story is uh, in the, I will not mention names because this needs to stay anonymous. Somebody stole the letters of Edith Wharton and Louis Bromfield from the Ohio State University Library at Mansfield and sent them to me. Uh, and I was horrified. <laughs> I'd never been to the library. Um, and so I read them and then I took them back to the library. <laughs> 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 and that's when I discovered the tribute. And I loved the tribute. And uh, I'm so glad uh, that Karen and John incorporated so much of the, the tribute into their performance because it's so beautifully written and, and really does show. Brownfield love of Edith Wharton. So that's that's really all I have to say. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have um, John and Karen with us, and they are regulars at Ashland Chautauqua. Uh, people know and love them, but I thought maybe uh, they could introduce themselves uh, to people who might not know them, and also what what drew you to these two characters. Um, so Karen, we'll let you go first. Uh, hello. It's uh, lovely to be here, and I, I, I love my Ashland friends. I know so many people on this list. Thank you so much for coming and supporting everything we do. Just really uh, important to me that you do. Ashland has a really special place in my heart. Um, what drew me to Edith Wharton first, I think, I mean, I always wanted to do Edith Wharton. I love love her novels, and I've read, you know, read so many of them and and when someone would say what character do you wish you could do i would say i wish you could do Edith wharton but i don't have a uh, a reason you know i don't have any uh, way to sell her right now and then i was in uh kansas and i went to the world war one museum and i said to my friend paula satoon i'd love to do Edith war i'd love to do a world war one character but the only character i know in that era is Edith wharton and she has nothing to do with world war one <laughs> <laughs> and of course now my as you as those of you who see my monologue know how incredibly involved she was in the war and so um i just became really passionate about edith she's uh, one of my later characters but i think she's one of uh, at the top of my list in terms of the her i when i do her i do almost all quotes i mean a lot of it is memorized quotes of edith wharton's because her language is so beautiful and evocative and it's just such passionate language and wonderful things to say and i i can talk about the war but i can talk about writing and gardens and and all the things that she did she was a remarkable woman and i think sadly she's being forgotten and so uh another reason i like to do her is to, to bring her back to the forefront if i can thank you karen okay john um I, I got to witness a little bit of John's story with this, but I'll let him tell it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I came to Ashland uh, to do William Faulkner talking about the movies. And uh, at the rehearsal weekend, the night before the week-long Chautauqua begins, uh, I got a question. I, I was talking as Faulkner about the, uh, the movie To Have and Have Not, uh, for which Faulkner contributed to the screenplay, even though the novel is by Ernest Hemingway. And I had a little bit to say about working with Ernest, with um, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. And so in the question and answer, I think one of the first questions was, well, you know that they got married here, Bogart and Bacall. And of course I didn't. <laughs> so I immediately started learning everything I could about uh, uh, Bromfield while I was performing Faulkner. And uh, it was so exciting uh, to, discover somebody who was so fascinating that I knew nothing about. And uh, so that led me to developing a performance as Bromfield, I think the very next year, in fact. 
and uh, it was a kind of crash course in, in Bromfield. It was a little intimidating to undertake Bromfield for the Ashland audience because so many of them had known him or remembered him. And uh, so it um, made me particularly uh, zealous at trying to learn everything I could about him. And as far as- Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I add, uh, as far as Wharton is concerned, I started working, uh, researching Wharton back in graduate school. I did a performance of a poem called The Lesson of the Master by Richard Howard, which is a poem in dialogue between Edith Wharton and a young man that I played, who's a fictional character. And um, so I did that a number of times, and uh, that really got me into Edith Wharton in a big way. And then later, as Henry James, I performed with uh, Lynn Miller from the University of Texas, now in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, as, War as, as Wharton. So I've now worked with three different Whartons playing three different men <laughs> interacting with her. First. We want to keep the <laughs> <laughs> collecting Whartons. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to add that I remember the first time um, we took John to Malabar Farm. I wasn't sure he was going to be able to fit all the books that he purchased <laughs> on Bromfield in a suitcase to fly back home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So um, let me start off with the first question that came in the chat, but I think it's a great way to start this because of the, the bond with the flowers. And somebody, Patricia asks, um, you mentioned several, the roses and the dahlias and the irises, which were your favorites? So I think this is going to the characters, which flowers were their favorites? Um. Again, I, you know, I, Patty just ran that one by me today, and I, I did some quick reading trying to find out. She does, I do think she did love those dahlias. I think the way she <laughs> talked about them and the way she talked about that, that whole story with the communist peasant that, that she meets. Um, but I, I don't know, if, like, could you choose a favorite child? I mean, they, she loved them all so much, just as she loved every one of her little dogs. And, um, and of course, you know, you love an iris in, in May and you love a, a, a Michaelmas daisy in, in, uh, in August. So, you know, that's the other thing is that they each have different times of year and, and, and what they do. So, John, do you have a better answer than that? <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, I would guess Dahlia's for the same reason. Uh, Daniel mentioned the tribute, which is, the essay that uh, uh, Bromfield wrote about Wharton after her death, and we begin and end our performance with passages from that tribute. It was never published in Bromfield's lifetime, apparently. And um, so I thought it was just a, a wonderful find that uh, Daniel included that in his book. And so he talks very eloquently about dahlias in there. He mentions roses a lot, and I thought people in uh, Ohio will maybe have a, uh, a mixed feeling about the multiflora rose, uh, which is something that he apparently introduced to the ecology of uh, North Central Ohio to the regret of a lot of people. He introduced that species, not for its beauty as a flower, but for its practical use as natural fencing, but it became invasive and kept spreading. The birds would eat the seeds and distribute them. And so, the, it became the bane of a lot of farmers' existence, trying to kill off the uh, multiflora rose. And personally, my favorite flower is the iris. I love the, the tall, willowy irises. And in June, my garden's gorgeous. <laughs> well, and Karen, it's interesting that you, you at, talk for yourself because a question came in for you saying that many of your characters have wonderful gardens. What does your garden i think look like uh, and are you drawn to characters with gardens or is it just a coincidence um i don't know if it's a coincidence i don't i never thought of it but i'm always i'm, I'm drawn to the characters who love the beauty of the earth so i think that would be um that would make sense there i there was a time my garden was gorgeous i haven't had much time lately to keep it going um, but i do sort of have a wild english garden in the back and especially there's about three weeks in may uh may, early june that it is really lush and beautiful it kind of doesn't it doesn't have the late summer appeal it used to have but um I, and i always think i'm going to do more and i never have time <laughs> but um i do love my garden so I think I'm going to circle back to uh, one of the questions um, that Daniel had hinted at a minute ago. Um, someone asked us, 
to ask the scholars tonight. Um, as an Ashland County native, they're wondering if there were artifacts or um, any reference to this part of Bromfield's life, which we know happened before Malabar Farms was founded, but are there any artifacts at Malabar Farms? So maybe Daniel or John or both um, can share what you know. I'll let Daniel start. Well, I went through all the, the library books at Malabar. Uh, I asked the guide if I could do so. And the only one I found one. Uh, no, wait a minute. It wasn't the farm. It would have been because it was in Brownfield's collection. So why would uh, she have inscribed the farm? It must have been at the same time she sent him one of her novels. I may have to go back and do some more homework on it. There is a book inscribed to Bromfield at Malabar Farm from Edith Wharton. Um, mm -hmm. My work was at the time uh, on um, Twilight Sleep. Oh. Um, and uh, I wrote an article on that uh, in which I actually titled it uh, Jefferson Democrat and a Victorian. Uh, in relation to, to the two authors. So I'm wondering if it wasn't the twilight sleep that I found in his library. But mm. uh, the reason I was thinking of the farm is of course, in the correspondence, Bromfield was working in the 1930s on the farm and Wharton talks about it as uh, not a, a novel, she, she refers to it as an autobiography actually. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, they, they uh, I think it's Stephen uh, Heyman who commented that uh, there's no record of what Wharton's actual response to the farm was other than her mentioning to him in the correspondence that she was aware he was writing on it. But of course, this was not uh, too long, uh, you know, her death was not too long after that. So uh, mm -hmm. there's not much correspondence after those letters talking about Brownfield being at work at the farm. So I, that's the only, the, the book, and, and, and uh, you know, I've always in my mind thought it was the farm, but it, it couldn't be the farm. Uh, that's the only artifact I know of. Have you come across any, John? Well, I remember from taking tours that a lot of the furniture in the house is from saint Lee, the house in saint Lee, uh, particularly the dining room, as I recall, and some of the living room furniture. And I, I think a lot of the paintings were probably in saint Lee. Uh, his house in Paris before he, um, or near Paris, I should say, before he bought and created Malabar Farm and the big house at Malabar Farm. Um, so I was thinking of physical artifacts like that, but I do remember being fascinated by all the books in the bookshelves when I would take tours. And I would, you know, when the tour guide was talking, I would be reading the titles of the books. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember being particularly fascinated, this is a little bit of a tangent, but, uh, uh, he contributed to a Disney film, an animated film, and there are some um, color stills from, I think it's Ferdinand the Bull, that uh, he contributed to the screenplay of that. Um, there are all kinds of wonderful artifacts in the house um, from not only the time in Paris, but later. And I, I will add, we, we skipped past John and Daniel in terms of the garden, the love of gardens, oh. but somebody did say that Daniel has a beautiful garden in the chat. So, yeah. Um, John, let me shift it to you with the question that we got. So just to put this in context, our theme for this summer, it was supposed to be last summer, but now for this summer is in times of war. And so the characters that we had chosen um, for our summer event, some have some sort of connection, some angle in terms of war. So this question, I think, comes within the context. And this question is from George Fryne. Um, so he's asking this to Louis Brumfield. Um, you are a farmer who was a soldier who saw action in World War I. Can you say something about the war as an attack on the land or on farms? Yes, he did uh, reflect on, uh, as he was driving ambulances in France, uh, seeing these farms that were devastated and also paying careful attention to the, uh, the ways the farms were cultivated. Um, 
he, he's written in a number of places that uh, the French people each have their own plot of land that's fairly small, but they have been able to sustain agriculture on it over generations by carefully renourishing the soil. And so the French farms that he saw during World War I were a major inspiration for him. And then of course he created a gorgeous uh, garden at Saint-Lys that um, was in some ways the inspiration for Malabar later. Um, and the other thing that I find very poignant is that when he saw uh, Hitler's coming to power, he knew war was coming and that uh, Saint-Lys, northwest of Paris, would be in the path that uh, Hitler took to come to Paris. And so he knew as early as 1937, I think, that he needed to get his family out of there. And so he sent his three daughters and his wife back to Ohio and then he stayed a little longer and um, uh, really hated to say goodbye to that plot of land, I think, in uh, near Paris. And, you know, I don't know that I've read of him ever going back there to see what it looked like after the war. That would have been very poignant, I think. And John, you know, this is a two part question, so I don't know if you've touched, I, I think you touched maybe a little bit on this, but, um, did Bromfield's life as a farmer influence what he saw as a soldier? And then did he ever think about the war when he went back to farming and writing about farming life later? Well, I know uh, he stayed on in France for, I think, about six months after the war ended and, you know, continued to tour the countryside. And so I think he was thinking a lot about farming then. Uh, watching, looking at what he was seeing in France. Um, as far as how being a soldier affected him as a farmer, uh, or was it farmer affected him as a soldier? Um, I think this is the reverse. I think this is the soldier affecting the farmer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I know he later, you know, during World War II, uh, was very outspoken about international affairs. And I think he always did see the Jeffersonian ideal of a self-sufficient farm is um, the, the, the alternative to war and to uh, international conflict. So I think it did have a very strong effect on his view of world politics. And he was fairly outspoken about politics. He became more and more conservative over time. At mm. first in the thirties, he was uh, a big supporter of FDR. But I think he became uh, concerned about the interference with um, uh, production of farms and agricultural policies. He was actually a contender to be the Secretary of Agriculture under, I guess, Truman, uh, and uh, had become a little too outspoken against the Democrats by then to really be a serious contender for that position. But he had a, a radio show and a newspaper column about agriculture by that time and uh, was considered, you know, a go-to voice in agricultural policy. Daniel, is there anything you want to add? Um, that I think? Just, for those who haven't read Stephen Heyman's biography, mm -hmm. the first chapter is really relevant to, to what we're discussing here because he, he starts with Bromfield uh, landing in Brest in 1918. Um, and uh, he, he has some wonderful observations about the, the strange juxtapositioning between all the carnage that Bromfield witnessed. The one that really sticks in my mind is he came across uh, a shell had blown up and they came across three men and one of them was missing his face. Hmm. And at the same time, uh, he, he cites not just Bromfield but other writers of the time who were at the front and, and, and talked about the the weird juxtapositioning of the, the beauty of the land, even though it was ravaged by, by the artillery and everything, you could still see these beautiful pastoral landscapes. And it was just such a disjunction to, to see the, the, you know, the, the beauty of these century old farms and, and then what was 
occurring in the present tense at that time. So I think that that chapter is just so that is a really astute way to begin the biography rather than the usual going back to uh, one's birth and childhood. He, he takes us right into things with that chapter. So if people haven't read the biography, uh, that that's a really strong, it's got some wonderfully evocative passages in it relating to war. And we've, we have um, on these book talks we've been doing, we've been gathering source ideas and sending them to everyone who's attending in our follow-up email. So maybe we'll reach out to Karen, John, and Daniel and say, you know, if you have book ideas that we could send, you know, like that or others, um, uh, send us an email and we'll get that out to you so that you have more reading to do. Um, I'm going to do one more garden question that came in the chat and then shift things a little bit. So please do feel free to add questions into the chat if you would like to ask something of any of the three on, uh, on any topic related to um, Wharton and Bromfield, either together or as separate individuals. But um, Dorothy Stratton asks, on their foreign travels, did either of them visit gardens and share impressions about them in their letters? So that could go to, all right, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Wharton wrote a, a book, Italian Garden, uh, Villas and Their Gardens, that was illustrated by Max D. Parrish, beautiful illustrations. But also, uh, she, uh, her favorite house in England uh, was Stanway, and uh, it, it's very, uh, it, it's, it's the house in the Buccaneers, uh, and her, her close friend Lady Weems lived there, and uh, today it's, it's, uh, Lord Needpath is there, and uh, we actually visited there. And, and uh, it was when, when they filmed the the Buccaneers that was actually uh, shot at Stanway. Mm -hmm. uh, so so yes, I mean uh, Wharton uh, not only wrote about Italian villas and their gardens, but you know she she also uh, uh, in terms of her fiction incorporated some of her favorite gardens into those. Mm. John or Karen, anyone want to add anything? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna switch things to Karen. Karen dropped a little tidbit in <laughs> the video, and we actually there was a lovely exchange on John's Facebook <laughs> when he shared the video. So, okay, Karen, people want to know about this uh, event at the hotel. The Sally. Yes. Uh, Edith Wharton famously. Let's let's do, and and I, I am I am quite intimidated by Dr. Bratton's credentials with Edith Wharton, so um, I will be careful what I say. But, you know, Edith was married for a while to a man that um, alleged they, they, they didn't have a, a romantic relationship. They were, they, they got along. He, he is, he uh, develops manic depression. Teddy Wharton is a manic depressive and in later years becomes even violent. I mean, his manic highs and lows are, are pretty, pretty radical. And, um, in the last years of her marriage, she has a pretty notorious romance with uh, a man named Morton Fullerton, who was, he was a newspaper man working in Paris, but he was working for American newspapers, but in Paris. Am I right in saying he was kind of a gigolo? I mean, he was, he was a very oh. younger and he was suave and he swept her off her feet and she has this romantic, passionate relationship to him. And after she has this relationship, she writes some of the most sensual, beautiful poetry she ever writes because of her experience with Morton Fullerton. Uh, there's there's uh, one in particular, um, but but there is one night at a train station, at a hotel at the train station in Sun Lee that they have one of their trysts. And, um, and she, remembers that fondly. The, 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 the relationship doesn't last. She then ends up divorcing Teddy, not because of his manic depression. I mean, he is, again, his father had it. Uh, lithium is not a possibility in the 1930s or 40s. So manic depression cannot be controlled. And his manic highs are, are pretty extreme and her friends are worried for her. And um, finally, his, his family accepts the fact that he needs to be kept and then and that's but that's not why she divorces him she divorces him because he's stolen money from her trust account to keep his his showgirls and um so that's eventually and, and then so when his mother dies his family pays her back the money he's stolen and she divorces him in 1913 um 
by this time, Morton Fullerton's already gone on to his next conquest or whatever, and she doesn't she doesn't rekindle with Morton, but she has um, a pretty steamy romance with this man, and the poetry that results is is very interesting. I think that poem's called Terminus, isn't it? Terminus, yes, 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 yes. It's about at a train station. So um, the poem Terminus. So I, I did. We, we, we purposely chose to drop that in and, and let that be a little dangling tidbit that you might follow up on. So I'm glad someone caught <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. There is another poem called saint Lee that is a shorter poem. And it's it's more descriptive of the, uh, the night and the flowers. Uh, it's not as sexy as Terminus, but <laughs> it's actually called Sonli. So we know that they went there. It was actually a kind of well-known excursion uh, destination for people in Paris to go and spend the day in Sonli. So John, I'm gonna shift to you because um, I do know there were there was a little talk, a little talk in the video about India. And so somebody is asking, Beverly's asking, what was the impetus that took Bromfield to India? Well, when he was living in uh, saint Lee, he would have uh, almost every Sunday a big open house uh, for brunch and all kinds of celebrities would come, uh, movie stars and actors and politicians, diplomats. And um, I think that was where he first made the acquaintance of uh, some Indian aristocrats and they invited him to come visit them in India. And so uh, he spent two long trips in India and was even seriously considering buying a farm in India at one point, um, but he ended up going to uh, Ohio instead. But he did name Malabar for uh, the Malabar coast of India. And he wrote two novels about India, The Rains Came and uh, Night in Bombay. So I think that's how that came about, was just his gregariousness as a, as a host and inviting all kinds of celebrities and uh, interesting people to his, his at-home buffets. And that came out in our, in our conversations in the letters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything to add, Daniel? Well, it, it's true in the letter that he refers to shooting a tiger, but I kind of wish it left it out because it'll really turn a lot of people off from you in mm. 2021. You know, it, it, it sounds a little too much Hemingway-esque or Donald <laughs> Trump Jr.-esque. <laughs> well, it is interesting that he was not as bloodthirsty as Hemingway by any stretch of the imagination. And he sort of regretted that. And there's a photograph of him and his uh, manager, George Hawkins, standing over the tiger that was shot. And is it Heyman? Somebody writes about his express, I think it's Heyman, writes about, you can see in his expression in the photograph, his discomfort with having shot this animal. And so he, he loved animals. So it was very uncharacteristic. I think he must have just gotten caught up in the exoticism <laughs> of being an Indian. So what other questions do people have? Um, I'm there was one here that said, did Edith Wharton's niece design any of Bromfield's gardens? Not to my knowledge, no. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we did, and then let me segue into that. We did make some choices to drop in a few other pieces of information that were not in the letters. And the bit about the niece is one of those. Uh, the other thing with the, in, the, the chance for the talking about India, gave us a segue for her to talk about Morocco and then the war. And so that gave us a chance to bring in this war theme, which is going to be part of Ashland's theme, but also important to both of these characters. So we, um, so we added a, just a very few, mostly, almost I would say 90% of the materials from the letters, but, but the, the bit about uh, Beatrix Ferrand is, is, was not in the letters. We just thought it was important because she was literally the first woman landscape architect in America and one of the most important landscape architects of her time. And she did what she did because of her aunt. I mean, her aunt gave her the social entrees that she needed, but also the, I mean, she visited her aunt and her aunt would take her to gardens and that's what started that whole thing. So, um, yes. And of course she did the mount. She did the, the mount, yes. Yeah. The mount. And, and closer to home for Ohio people, Overland's campus, the landscape uh, huh? 
the time was by David. Mm. Yeah. Oh, she did Harvard and Princeton and Brown. And she also did the, the Rose Garden, which has, I understand, been quite devastated lately. Mm. Okay, so here's a question about about the excluding of things. So, you know, it seemed that during the presentation, some letters were excluded. Did you choose to exclude uh, or are they missing? So, we, you know, we jumped time frames. But there are some letters missing. Definitely. There, there, there were several times where we went, like I would do three in a row or two, or John would do two in a row because uh, it seemed to be there were more letters from Edith than from John, am I right? Uh, than from Lewis, Edith. Um, um, my sense is that it's roughly equal. Daniel, what's your sense? Uh, were there as many Wharton as Bromfield letters? It seems initially in the early 30s, they seem, as I recall, they're more from the Bromfields to Wharton. But then, uh, you know, when he was away at, when he went to Princeton that time, and also when he was in India, although he wrote detailed accounts to Wharton of what he was up to in India, but uh, you know, her, her, her uh, presence is to me much more discernible sort of in the middle of the correspondence. Uh, and it's very interesting, there was this, when they first corresponded, there was this wonderful formality of Mrs. Wharton. And, and then, you know, the, you could just feel them warming to each other uh, through the correspondence. We hope that we showed that in, the, in our program, that was one of our goals. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, there, there were choices that we made to not include every single letter. In every single word of every letter, we try to make it as um, distill it into something that we could do in 45 to 50 minutes. And that was that was our choice. And well chosen. <laughs> so, um, are the houses and the gardens mentioned in the letter still standing, and can people visit them? <laughs> I, Daniel has a good answer to that, I think. <laughs> Yes, I, I went to uh, Sabri Soufouré and saw the Pavillon Cologne with the Edith Wharton Society. And it's a, a private house, or it was, this is back quite some time ago. It's surrounded by housing now. It's, it's, it's you know, mm -hmm. any reference to it as being rural is, is lost. It, it's like a little enclave with these big high walls around it. And it was occupied by the prince, Princess of Liechtenstein. <laughs> who allowed us in and the cover of my book is taken by me in that garden. Ah, nice. Even though we were prohibited from taking photographs, I couldn't resist. <laughs> well, stolen letters, it. stolen photos. This is getting better all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, the princess actually told the ward, uh, head of the tour that there were no, after she saw me take a photograph, she didn't want anyone to very private. Actually, she uh, it, it, she seemed like something out of a Wharton novel from the <laughs> early 30s. She, she seemed, uh, this is no offense to the Prince of Lichtenstein, but she looked a bit like Zsa Gabor and Gogo Boots. <laughs> so it's, so yeah, yeah, I've been to, uh, I've never been to St. Clair though, have you? I've not had the good fortune now. Okay, so I'm gonna stick with a, a, the, a question. I will get back, Ruth, to yours, but um, what other sources other than the letters about their relationships are available? Well, I can say a little bit about that. Uh, we use secondary sources, uh, Hermione Lee's biography of Edith Wharton, uh, Stephen Heyman and Scott Ivan's biographies of, um, of Bromfield. And we would you know, sort of adapt third person material into first person. Uh, for example, the story about F. Scott Fitzgerald is taken from other sources. Um, and um, and Edith, so I, I used Edith's A Backward Glance, which is her autobiography. Oh. So, I, so when, I, I, when I talked about finding the house in Sombreeze, uh, that was from that. So we used the autobiographical work. I'm going to reword one of these questions slightly because somebody asked, Ruth asked, if you only had time to read one novel by Bromfield, which would you recommend? So I will ask that John and Daniel ask, answer that. And then, and then I'm going to say, let's ask that about Wharton too. And then Karen and Daniel could chime in on that. So um, John, maybe we'll let you start. Well, my gut instinct is to say the Green Bay tree, um, 
uh, for some reason, that's the novel that I have found most satisfying of his. Um, I also thoroughly enjoyed Mrs. Parkington, for example, but it's, it's a lesser novel. Uh, he won the Pulitzer for Early Autumn, which is part of a series of novels that begins with Green Bay Tree and goes to Possession, Early Autumn, and then A Good Woman. Those four novels together um, are sort of interrelated in various ways. Um, I'd be curious what Daniel says. I, I totally agree with you. I was going to oh. say The Green Bay Tree. It was the first <laughs> novel. It was in my parents' library. It was the first uh, novel by Brown Sea that I read. Ah. And, and people from Mansfield should love that novel because it's about the transformation of Mansfield. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. And I had the pleasure of touring the house in Mansfield that is uh, the house in Green Bay Tree is based on. And that's a wonderful house. It's his great aunt's house, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's um, Oak Hill Manor for those of you in the Ashland area. And I, I was, I visited it and then read the book after. And it's, it's so much fun to read that book after you visited that house um, because you really feel like you're there. Yeah. I have to say, he also adapted that novel as a play, which I've never read. It was done on Broadway and the actress Nance O'Neill played the, the mother and she was a close friend of the ex the alleged axe murderous Lizzie Borden. Uh, and I was fascinated by that, that somebody I'd only read about in the connection with Lizzie Borden was in this play on Broadway written by Lewis Bromfield. <laughs> so, okay, Karen, who, uh, if you could only, only had time to read one Wharton. One Wharton, oh my gosh, only one. Um, of course, everyone always, always cites Age, Age of Innocence, but really my favorite of hers is House of Mirth. I, I, I really love that. And I think that that was what, you know, the one that her breakout, you know, what really made her a, a celebrity writer. And I guess if that's, if that's the word, it really, you know, brought attention to her work. I, and the other, but the other one that I do love is, is, um, is A Son at the Front, which is her World War One piece being living in Paris. Um, uh, an American artist's son has gone to the front and dies. And it's, and it's, it's just really powerful. So I gave two, didn't I? Deanna, what about you? What's your favorite of, of, of the Edith Wharton books? Well, I would have said The Age of Innocence, but I do love The House of Mirth as well. Did you see recently in The New Yorker, there was a really interesting article on the custom of the country oh, I... within the last oh. month, I think. And there actually was a similar Zoom session uh, about that uh, subsequent oh, to the I didn't see article. It. I think uh, that's a really interesting novel in terms of uh, Wharton's uh, argument with America and how it pertains yeah, yeah. to the contemporary America. And that, that's what the article was about in New Yorker was. Yeah. And, yeah. and you did ask us for one, but I would say her ghost stories are wonderful. She's got she's got a, a books of ghost stories that are just chilling, you know, in a very sort of intellectual way. So I do, I you know, you you could read a book of short stories and get a whole plethora of of stories from her that are just wonderful as well. She wrote quite a few short story books. So you don't get to just read one of Wharton. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to find time. <laughs> House of Mirth. I I, I love that book. But it was, but it was, and when I was in high school, it was Ethan Frome. We mm. always, always read Ethan Frome in high school. And that's what started my love of Wharton was that book. So, um, you know, and it's, and there is, it's that, that twist at the end and, and, and it's short. If you're, you know, <laughs> if you're to, so I'm sorry, now I'll give you four. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so here's another question. Did the Bromfields ever visit Edith in, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Hi, Hyers, H Y E R E S. Hyers, yeah. yes. Hyers. They did. And we mentioned it in the letters, in fact, in, in the performance. Yeah. They, they, they stop in one time when they're south. That, that's one of the things that, that we've talked about subsequently is that we, John and I, always had the same backgrounds, but we were actually in different places, that the letters were coming from different places. And many of Edith's letters were from Provence. So um, from her house down south. So um, so they just stop one time on the way home from Sumpler. I think the second letter in the sequence that we perform, he's he's raving about her garden in Hier. Um, and they had apparently stopped there. They would go skiing in Switzerland um, and they would come back through the Riviera, I guess, on their way up to uh, Saint-Louis. And that's when they stopped off in saw that house. 
and for what it's worth, her house in Provence uh, was formerly a convent looking out over the Mediterranean. And it's really, uh, it's, it's stunning. Is it, is it, uh, is, that, is that correct, Daniel? Do I have that correct? You look puzzled. Said, okay. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep deferring to Daniel. <laughs> um, here's a Bromfield question. Did Bromfield continue writing after he moved to Ohio or did he just shift his focus to agriculture and the environment? Well, he continued to write novels with less enthusiasm, I think, because um, he was really focused on farming and he wrote a lot of nonfiction books about farming, but he kept needing to publish bestsellers and sell them to the movies in order to finance Malabar Farm. And unfortunately, by the mid forties, critics were not as enthusiastic about his fiction as they had been early on. I mean, he was compared to, Falk, uh, to uh, Hemingway, and Fitzgerald, he was really more well known than they were in the 20s. Um, but by the 40s, uh, he was considered kind of a hack, unfortunately. Um, Edmund Wilson, who was a very prominent literary critic, wrote a really cruel review of whatever, what happened to Anna Bolton in 1944. And it's one of the most vicious reviews I've ever read, just ridicules him. And that stung Bromfield, I think, but he continued to crank out the books and um, he still, you know, worked in Hollywood sort of from afar, you know, uh, he wrote the screenplay for a, a book about um, the famous Mormon, um, I'm blanking on his name. Um, anyway. Um, Brigham Young? Brigham Young, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. He wrote a screenplay about Brigham Young and. And of course, uh, The Rains Came was adapted as a Hollywood movie in 1939 and again in 1955, just before Bromfield died in 1956. So uh, it was fairly lucrative to write novels, even if they weren't critically well received. And Mrs. Parkington was nominated for Academy Awards. Uh, that was in the late 40s, I think, 18, 1948, maybe. Um, a Greer Garson, Walter Pigeon movie that holds up pretty well, I think. So um, he kept writing, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that when George Hawkins died, he, he stopped writing novels. Yeah, that's revealing. Yeah. yeah, George Hawkins was his manager and sort of would crack the whip and tell him it's time to write another book because we need to pay bills. And uh, that kept him continuing to write fiction but after Hawkins died in the early 50s, um, I think his last novel was Mr. Smith. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so here's a question. Did the two meet in person very often or was the relationship mostly through the correspondence? I really don't know the answer to that, Daniel. Do you? Well, I, th I mean, you know, there are references to, to Morton dropping by the Presbyter, but um, she was kind of put off by the, the <laughs> sort of uh, the way Brownfield was living there, the, the promiscuous nature of his entertainments on Sunday and that sort of thing. So uh, Wharton always had that very patrician side. And I think she kind of thought of herself as above and remote from that that loose kind of society. So uh, my impression is uh, the correspondence was really essential to their friendship. I mean, uh, when she would visit him would be when nobody else was there. That that's come out that uh, you know she, uh, she she would uh, find out in advance that there were going to be no other guests. And, and of course, that wouldn't be that often. <laughs> 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 they both traveled so much. And she she was gone for the cold months down to Provence. To you know, she left and you know, I, but she never came back till June even. Um, so so she was she was in, in at Saint Har at Har for a good good part of the year. And he visited her there once or twice, but you know, she was not a, not in San I have a question, and for any of you. So they had this connection through the gardening. Did 
either of these people have similar kind of connections with somebody else that, that came through this gardening or was this unique just to Wharton and Bromfield that, you know, really bonded the two of them? Well, of course there's Gertrude Stein. I mean, Bromfield and Stein's connection with gardening too. It was gardening, Although okay. She certainly and, and wasn't, she wasn't, wasn't the gardener that Edith Wharton was. Edith Wharton actually made the statement uh, once that she, she thought she may have been better at gardens than she was at novels. I mean, she really was a horticultural authority. And uh, uh, Gertrude Stein apparently did have a beautiful garden, uh, but it wasn't in the same league as, as Edith Wharton's. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty obvious that uh, Stein and Brownfield's relationship was similarly very much related to their love of gardens. And I would say her and her niece Beatrix, Edith and her niece Beatrix Durand, um, certainly. I mean, they were they were aunt and and, and niece, but uh, and and uh, she was one one of uh, Edith's heirs. But uh, still, at the same time, they, they really developed this love of garden together, gardening. And and Beatrix's mother Minnie and she and and Edith were so close. Uh, be it, Minnie divor was divorced from Edith's brother and Edith didn't keep in touch with her brother, but she kept in touch with Minnie. And um, Minnie's the mm -hmm. one that actually runs the Edith Wharton societies in America during the war to raise money for all of Edith's char charities in Paris. Mm -hmm. She's the American uh, go-getter that makes it happen. Somebody chimed in on the chat about Henry James. Uh, yes. I know you were gonna say something. Yeah, I saw that comment too, because it's actually somebody I know who posted it. Uh, yes, she, of course, uh, would, would visit James at Lamb House in Rye. Where, in, in, uh, again, James wasn't you know, the same sort of gardener that Wharton or Bromfield were. He had a gardener, but you know, that was obviously a, a beautiful garden too. And uh, the, the friendship that's not literary that I think needs to be mentioned here is her, her uh, Wharton's friendship with Lawrence Johnston. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it, when she went up to see Stanway and Lady Wings, she would go visit him at Hidcote. And that was, you know, uh, Stanway may have been her favorite house in England, but I mean, Hidcote was her favorite garden. And then, of course, Lawrence Johnston also had uh, a house not far from hers in the south of France. Uh, you know, in terms of my own book, To My Horror, I didn't see the color inserts when it was printed and it came back. And in the color inserts, he's referred to as uh, Lawrence Johnson and I wrote to uh, Michigan State University Press and said, you know, what happened? And they they farmed out the proofreading and or the, the copy editing. And the woman said that she was thinking of Howard Johnson when she was doing it. So she used the Johnston to Johnson. Uh, but that was a very special friendship as well that she had with Lawrence Johnson. And that was again totally rooted in their passion for gardening. I also have a sense that uh, uh, both Wharton and James were very good friends with Howard Sturgis, who was an American who expatriated in England, who also was a big gardener as well, if I'm not mistaken. And so we go here's a Smith. Yes, yes. So uh, their whole circle, social circle, were often avid gardeners and fans of gardens. Going back to the cover of the book, I just wanted to ask Daniel, um, where is where was that photograph taken of of uh, Bromfield and Wharton? Is that in front of Pavillon Cologne? It's an insert that's been put in there. Yes, and it's uh, actually it must be, but it. I don't, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to remember because I've seen the, you know, the, the uh, photograph itself in a different context. Uh, somebody, actually it was a former president of the Edith Wharton Society recently sent a photograph and wondered if the person was, Mar was of Mary Bromfield and it was down at St. Clair actually that it was taken. Getting huh? back to the question of did the Bromfield visit down there? Yeah. But yeah, I th I'm pretty sure that is at Pavi and Cologne. That and is that one of the photographs that's now lost? Oh, that's another story, yes. No, I think that, I, I, I must have an acknowledgement, there must be within the book an acknowledgement of that photograph at some point, but I don't know where it is. Yes, the horror story is the uh, Ellen Bromfield, who of course died last year, the last of Bromfield's daughters to, to be living, um, sent me a bunch of photographs that 
uh, were from um, from Salis, and, and uh, they were really there. Some of them are in the book, and they went to Michigan State, and uh, they became they, they were lost. And I I felt so awful because I know how much Ellen Bromfield cherished those photographs, and I, I should have. I should never have sent them down to East Lansing. I should have just made copies and sent them right back to, to Ellen. But anyway, mm -hmm. history now. Mm -hmm. oh. There are quite a few uh, photographs of, of Brownfield and Wharton and Gardens at Ohio State mm -hmm. in the library. At the main campus, not the Mansfield uh, campus. Yeah, they were in the Mansfield campus. And then of course, I, I did all my research at the Mansfield campus and then subsequently it, it was, you know, that's how they disappeared in the first place, is that was not a properly supervised right. collection. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, they went to Columbus shortly after uh, I'd been doing my research there. But yeah, there's, there, there were photographic albums uh, with, with uh, pictures of Edith Wharton in them. So here's an Edith question, Karen. Uh, Edith was rather snarky in her attitude towards Sinclair Lewis. What was that about? <laughs> Well, I, we threw some of the, those were in the letters. I mean, we didn't make, make any of that up. And we did feel like we needed some highs and lows and some, a little bit of humor. Uh, yes, they had this complicated relationship because the year she received the Pulitzer Prize, he was supposed to have received it. But that year, the Pulitzer Prize committee says they add, they add the word wholesome to their prize. Their, we are looking for wholesome books about America and, 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 um, Sinclair Lewis was a bit more sensational. And so Edith gets the prize and um, he was really angry. And she wrote to him and said, you should have gotten the prize. And that smoothed things over and they sort of became friends. And she was friends with his first wife, but she didn't like it when he divorced Grace and married Dorothy Thompson. So, um, so, and again, of course, there's a story that he's been drunk since he left America and, and he was just, so she was just, yeah, she was a little snarky and she was definitely snarky to F. Scott Fitzgerald who came and made a buffoon of himself at her house. Um, but, you know, I mean, she, this was her, I mean, this was, she kind of, um, she, uh, patrician is the word that Daniel used and I liked it. You know, it was, that's, that was her. You know, I mean, she was raised in this society that she disdained and wrote so awfully about, but she ultimately is a product of that society. I, I just wanted to add about Sinclair Lewis and Bromfield is uh, they knew each other fairly well, but uh, over time, Lewis became pretty critical of Bromfield. He published some unflattering reviews of his work. And so I think Bromfield had reason to have a grudge against uh, Sinclair Lewis, maybe not as early as in the letters, but at least later. Um, and uh, there's an interesting uh, relationship between Bromfield and Hemingway. Hemingway was really snarky and mean about Bromfield behind his back. <clears throat> and you do Robert Frost and I do Pearl Buck and Frost was really cruel to Pearl. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Faulkner, it was even worse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, this segues nicely to the question that, that's at the bottom here, that even though they were kindred spirits uh, and the sense, was there ever a sense of competition between the two because of their writing or their gardens? So was there any snark here? He said so in, the in one of the letters, he said there was a bit of a friendly competition with them as writers. And I think that whole Hamiltonian Jeffersonian thing, you know, I mean, I think that really, she, she wasn't as, you know, um, back to the land as he was and, and he and she, he was he wasn't as fond of the bankers and the hybrid he, again she she disdained that society but that's she's a product of that society didn't you find um i don't know in performing this if, if you you felt that way karen but uh bromfield was i thought kind of snarky towards wharton and, and casting her in with the hamiltonians in a kind of disdainful way, you know. Yeah, and, and then the whole thing about, you know, you know, I, I'd rather, my mother thinks I'm playing on a brothel, which is better than being a banker. And I mean, yeah. you know, he, he was really, he was really getting his digs in, one me. Yeah. yeah. I loved their expressions, by the way, when that letter was being read. I think. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's funny. You think she was, what, 37 years older than Bronson? Yes. 34, uh, I think. 34 years older than Bronson. 
and uh, you know, he he was very much from the society that she satirized in works like Cuts and River Bracket and The Gods Arrive and Twilight Sleep, as well as The Custom of the Country. Uh, you know, there must have been much about Brownfield that she found rather crass. And of course, he was an, an unabashed social climber, which she would have abhorred. There must have been so much about him of which she did not really approve. That's and fascinating. That, yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> and, and and likewise, it must have been about her that he didn't approve. She was of this patrician class of this, you know, uh, you know, sanctimonious. I'm up here, and everybody. I can't possibly speak to Gertrude Stein, and you know. So, and those were his friends. And so, how could he have, you know? There must have there must have been. A, and then there was a little competition saying, "Oh, you've sold something." Well, I haven't sold anything. I and I can't even can't get the publisher to pay me for it. There was a little of that back and forth too. I wonder if maybe uh, Mary Wood Bromfield was kind of a connection between Bromfield and Wharton and the social class because his wife was from Boston Brahmin stock and uh, would have you know, known that world that Wharton came from, a different generation obviously, but, uh, and you know, uh, Bromfield drew on that a lot in his novels early on like Green Bay Tree or more in uh, early autumn, for example, um, but, um, he, he, had a, he was a chameleon. He was able to fit himself into all kinds of social situations. And uh, so I, I wonder how much Wharton saw through that. Probably she did. But he seemed able to ingratiate himself with just about all walks of life. OK. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Karen. Which was not Edith's forte. That was not what she, she, what she would do. <laughs> So John mentioned Mary. Daniel, I wanna ask you a question because when you tour Malabar Farms, one of the things they talk about is, uh, there's, a, there's a little poem on the wall, framed on the wall, and they talk about the potential that Green Acres, the TV show Green Acres, might have gotten some inspiration from the Bromfields. Have you ever heard anything about that? Okay. No, I have. I thought you were okay. going to refer to his remorseful that, that's on the, vegetable stand of course there's uh, after mary's death he had something put on one of the oh yeah um, but of course mary uh, was an aspiring writer too which is interesting mm. and in, in uh, some of their correspondence when he was out in hollywood uh, there, there's a, a great sense of uh, disappointment on mary's part that you know she'd been you know the perfect wife to brownfield's fame but in the process she negated a lot of her own ambitions probably as a writer. Hmm. That's not answering your question, but it's been interesting that I saw. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. I was just curious because that, that stuck in my mind and I it sounded it sounded like better lore than than fact, but yeah. Are there other I questions? To add, uh, her bed in Malabar Farm is inscribed, the headboard of it is inscribed with the titles of his novels. And in the center of it is A Good Woman, which is the fourth of those series of novels. And it's a very ironic title because the good woman of the title of the novel is a horrible woman. And so I, I just find it very ironic. And this is something Stephen Heyman points out in his recent biography is the irony of that being the headboard of her bed. So I know we have people zooming in from all over Canada and all over the place, but if you are in the area and you haven't been to Malabar Farms, it really is interesting to go a, on a tour of the big house and uh, some of this will, will come to life a little bit for you. Yeah. Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, so let's see, oh, okay. Just that, thank you. Um, I, I do want to invite all of you to come back in about a month. Um, we have two more book talks to go. The next one is on April 22nd, and so it will be another Zoom event. And um, Jim Armstead will be with us, who will portray Benjamin O. Davis. And um, what we're looking at is an autobiography by Davis. I know it's a little hard to find this book. Um, I got it through A Books a while back, but um, some people are having trouble locating it, even if you don't get a chance to read the book or it's a pretty thick tome. Even if you don't make it all the way through the book, please come and join us. This is a fascinating story. I know Dorothy and I are both part way into this book and um, 
it's really uh, an interesting social commentary on issues that we're discussing in current events. Um, and it's fascinating to hear Davis's own experience uh, of living um, as a black man trying to uh, fulfill his dreams in uh, the United States where he hit many, many barriers. So we hope you join us on the 22nd for that. And then our last book talk will be May 20th where um, Kevin Radical will be here and will talk about the book, um, Eric Larson's The Splendid and the Vile, um, which is about Churchill family and defiance during the Blitzkrieg is the subtitle. So we have these two book discussions to go. Our fingers are crossed that all kinds of vaccines happen and all kinds of good things come our way for July because July 13th through the 17th, we are planning to bring our five scholars to town to do the characters of Hemingway and Gertrude Bell and um, Eric Marie Remark, Benjamin O. Davis and Churchill. And so if you can make it to Ashland, Ohio, July 13th through the 17th, it will be the place to be. Um, and we're just hoping that that all goes smoothly. And we're going to continue these book talks through the next year with our scholars that are, Lizzie Borden was mentioned earlier. Lizzie's coming in 22. Um, oh. <laughs> and Annie Oakley's coming. And, you know, we um, Marie Curie's coming in 22. So we're going to be having another series of book talks from the fall into the spring, uh, leading into our 22. So you just have to keep reading. And you have to keep coming back and joining us for these events um, because we think star, Go Bush, and I just wanted to also add, please consider doing the survey. It helps us with our grant information and we really appreciate the data and the numbers. So take a minute, it's in the chat. Go ahead and go to our Google form and do the uh, survey. Thank you, go ahead, Karen. And I just wanna clarify that uh, unfortunately we will not be doing Edith Wharton and uh, Louis Bromfield. Right. This summer, those were those were characters we have both done in the past in Ashland, and so this summer we are both coming uh, to participate. But he will be Hemingway, and I will be Gertrude Bell, the Middle East expert. So, um, so unfortunately, uh, but we're always happy to talk about Edith and Louis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and we started with Henry James and Wharton originally, and then that's when they said, "But wait a minute." we could also do something about this friendship with Bromfield. And so that, that's how this happened. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, John, were you gonna add one more thing? Uh, I was just gonna say, if you come to Ashland to see the Chautauqua, you can also tour Malabar Farm and go to the big house. <laughs> and go to Oak um, Hill Manor and oh. um, see, see Bromfield's aunt's house. Yeah, we have all, all kinds of things for you to do. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining. Please fill out the survey. Um, thanks, Star, for reminding me. Uh, those grant people have to give us, uh, we need their money to keep doing this programming. And without data, they are not as likely to give us the grants. So you can do your part to help us keep this going for 20 more years. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel, for joining us. Thank you, John and Karen, for creating a beautiful performance and joining us tonight. And thank you, question askers, for asking your questions tonight. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you all to my friends at security. Thank you. I have a fast question for Daniel before you sign off. I didn't catch the title of the book you were referencing um, in chapter one, and it was um, just a really good reference um, that Stephen- You mean about the war? Yes. Oh, That's yes. Stephen Heyman's book, The Planter of Modern Life, and the subtitle is Louis Bromfield and the Seeds of a Food Revolution. And it's published okay. by W.W. W. Norton. I'm just going to Google that. But thank you so much for that info. I and appreciate it, Daniel. Star, I'll send a quick email to the three of them and say, all any right. books you want us to send out, let's get the all the details. And that way awesome. we can keep you all reading and yep. exploring. Yeah. yeah. Look for an email tomorrow. So thanks, yeah. everyone. Thank Good you. you Good night. Daniel, love to meet you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. That was lovely. That was just lovely. Mm -hmm. wow. so, many, so many old friends came to that. I had at least Becky <laughs> Stone, huh? Becky. <laughs> A lot of old Ashton friends came. It was nice.
Yeah, that's great. That's great. They love you, Karen. <laughs> this town loves you. <laughs> <laughs> I love There's, it. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Out of all college friends came, you know, which is really fun. Yeah. I heard I heard the little shout out to your sorority there at the <laughs> beginning. <laughs> and John and Lori are joining us from the Great Smoky Mountains. Wow. <laughs> they're on vacation. Oh, okay. And yet they're here tonight. Oh, oh man, oh, that's dedication. Yeah. It's raining yeah. cats and dogs here. It is raining all hard all day. All day. Oh, oh. We, we can hardly can... hear you guys sometimes. It's raining so hard. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry about that. But you that's got okay. some nice days. In. Oh, yeah, we had some nice yeah. days. And biking. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Oh, Becky's still on. Yeah, are you there, Becky? She's muted. Yeah. Well, we're saying hello, oh, Becky. Oh, Becky Stone. I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, I think it's Rosa Parks. Yeah. <laughs> anywhere. My Angelou. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I. Everyone this summer. Ron is still on too. Ron and Becky and Becky. Mm -hmm. Ron. Ron's our loyal supporter from Tulsa. <laughs> Ron's on mute now. Everything you're doing. I'm sorry, John. <laughs> Thanks. All right, everybody, I can let you go on your merry way if you wish. Is there? I, I would love to see the video uh, if you can. I'll send, send it to on. you. Yeah. It's, it, can... By tomorrow, I should be able to email it to yeah. you. Like, and I, I'll pass it on to Beth. I knew she would have trouble getting on. Uh, but it's funny, we've been doing a, an email exchange where I keep dropping clues as to who Morton Fullerton is. <laughs> and he keeps making guesses. I, I answered it. And then oh. I saw you say, wait for the discussion. So I went back and deleted it real quick. <laughs> I wrote an answer in to that discussion, that thread. And then um, I thought, oh, and then you said, wait, oh, maybe I better wait. Maybe I better hold that. So oh. <laughs> yeah. she guessed Richard Halliburton, who had had an affair with the Rene of Sarawak, but it was a different Rene of Sarawak than the one. Morton Fullerton had an and I mean, There's actually a book called The Sex Education of Edith Wharton. And I <laughs> I've seen that it. title. <laughs> so, um, and I, I have it sitting on my, but, but you know, the part that I started, then I started Gertrude Bell, you know, and then I started Mama Cass. And then, you know, it's just like I get, I get, I get sidetracked. So. <laughs> I was going to mention, um, oh, she's gone now, but the uh, star, there's a little <laughs> bibliography at the end of the video, and that has the four key texts that we used and would make good recommendations for for reading yeah um is do you guys have that in a word in yeah, word I, form? I, have that in I, I do form. yeah because yeah. that would be easier probably than because that's a pd or a mp3 that we Let's wouldn't be able to the slide do i have yeah. her email do i have stars email well, I'll, I'll send you all an email and you can send them to me and i'll get them to her that way I'll do it right now because I've okay. got it in front of me. Yeah. Okay. Great. 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 Okay. Thanks. I'll sign off. Then. Thanks, John. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Thanks John and Lori. Bye. Bye. John, I don't need to Thanks, Ron, for coming. Bye-bye. Yeah. John, you're sending it, right? I don't need to send it. Yeah, yeah. I'll send it right now. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. All right. Bye. 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 Oh, and uh, break oh. a leg with little women, Karen. Oh, yes, thank you. That opens tomorrow night. Wow. Yeah. I'll be so glad that it's over. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye. Bye. -bye. bye.